Sean, I believe, uh, suggested that it would be a challenge uh, for me to follow all the uh, insightful comments that you've heard already. But uh, maybe um, Michael or Andrew were thinking ahead uh, in organizing this, um, since uh, this is my first AAG meeting and I come to you from uh, a political science uh, disciplinary starting point, uh, more interdisciplinary these days, I think I can add some uh, um, uh, perspective that hasn't necessarily been covered. And it's more about the, uh, the how or the how not to implement uh, uh, a high-speed rail paradigm shift in the U.S. Uh, political administrative uh, context. I would argue that from a purely empirical as opposed to a normative uh, point of view, um, that is about the only thing we can really um, study um, concretely at this point in the policy cycle with high-speed rail in the U.S. because it's politics that put the goal of having a high-speed rail network or program or initiative of some form onto the nation's uh, transport uh, agenda and it's politics that has emerged as um, uh, the uh, the main variable in in trying to uh, implement that uh, and, and an increasingly partisan form of conflict over what to do and where to do it and even whether to do it uh, at all so once uh, we ever get beyond that, or if we get beyond that, I think there's going to be a lot to analyze uh, along the lines that have already been discussed about the spatial, economic, social, and environmental, and energy uh, dimensions of high-speed rail. But in order to get there, I would suggest that a reconciliation between at least what uh, public policy types like me call uh, goals and capacity has to occur. And that's what I'll focus on in my comments. Um, I, I think that when we talk about policy paradigm shifts or creating new policy paradigms like uh, Social Security or uh, Medicare or maybe even uh, the U.S. current uh, future um, national health insurance uh, scheme, um, having those paradigms uh, come together requires aligning two not inherently compatible dimensions of governance know-how, um, at least from a political perspective. First, one has to have the political skills to um, power through new goals, to push ahead uh, onto the government's uh, agenda. And uh, I, I think it's clear that President Obama did this in um, um, the opening of his administration with the stimulus uh, program. And we can talk about why it got uh, bundled into that if people want. Um, but he introduced a vision for high-speed rail and uh, put $8 billion into that uh, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act to um, be the opening bid, if you will, in uh, a high-speed rail um, program. But uh, that's only one part of the, uh, the formula for a paradigm shift. Uh, secondly, one has to either have or be able to quickly develop the administrative capacity to implement such a policy um, and advance the goals. Um, without that, <coughs> you can't uh, really legitimate the, uh, the paradigm and uh, sooner or later, and in this case it's been rather sooner, people begin criticizing and saying that it's uh, uh, not feasible or worse uh, along the way. So as I'm going through the litany of woes that have beset efforts to launch uh, this policy paradigm, I'd ask you to think about uh, what uh, is needed and how likely it is that some of these constraints can be overcome. Um, or what the chances of introducing a new option um, might be in this area. So the U.S. Is, is, has lost a great deal of policy capacity for passenger rail during the uh, long and protracted stalemate over uh, whether to preserve Amtrak, which has already been mentioned um, in uh, somewhat critical terms, um, which I would certainly not uh, uh, object to. So whether to preserve Amtrak or to abandon it uh, has been the extent, at least pre-Obama, of what uh, American um, policy debates about passenger rail have been. And that's resembled uh, trench warfare of World War I um, in the sense that both the uh, skeptics and the supporters are dug into their positions, too uh, heavily fortified to be uh, expelled and defeated. Occasionally they lob missiles at each other um, and have uh, occasional flashes of combat, but mostly it's trench warfare, except that this has lasted 10 times as long as the original trench warfare in World War I. Um, before Amtrak, actually just before Amtrak, there was a viable public-private partnership which produced America's uh, most successful uh, 20th century passenger train from a commercial point of view. Um, that was the Metroliner, the predecessor to uh, Acela. And again, I go into the details behind that, but it has been done before in the United States in at least modern times, um, mid-20th century. 
Um, but since Amtrak was created, the private uh, freight-oriented railroads have abandoned the passenger train as a commercial opportunity, and um, the rail passenger design and manufacturing sector has completely atrophied in this country. So the industrial piece is uh, co a complete vacuum uh, uh, these days. Um, so uh, when it came time to figure out how to implement high-speed rail in the Obama um, goal of a national program and system, um, there was a complete vacuum on both the private operating sector um, and the private industrial uh, technology sector of who would put this into place. And the federal government's uh, plan uh, really punted all of that uh, uh, non-capacity over to the states. Um, state governments were assigned the prime role in implementing high-speed rail projects, and they still are under federal uh, policy with high-speed rail. Um, but the states were among the least equipped of all the potential public sector entities uh, out there to um, uh, draw upon um, any kind of experience and to uh, be able to innovate uh, in any substantive way. Even Amtrak, uh, much maligned as it is, does have real-world operating experience with 100-mile-an-hour passenger trains on good days, but they were not um, centered uh, in this uh, implementation and were left pretty much uh, as just another stakeholder. Um, unlike the financial sector and the auto industry, which have been, which the, at least the auto industry was mentioned, uh, America's railroads were not beholden to government. Uh, as has been noted, they were private, are private, and they didn't need a bailout in 2008. Um, they were probably the strongest part of the American transportation sector in 2008 in the sense that they were actually still making money, a bit less than before, but uh, they weren't going bankrupt and they didn't need uh, government's uh, uh, assistance. And they were thus in a position to say no thanks to the high-speed rail funds that would flow through the states and only accept them on their own terms. Those terms led to a goal displacement, which some people might say was justified, um, of high-speed rail down to the lower end of the uh, speed range, below 100 miles an hour. Uh, the uh, American Association of Railroads, the trade industry organization for the big freight carriers, has said that uh, 80 miles an hour is about the uh, upper limit of what you should mix freight and passenger trains on the same infrastructure, whether they're talking about the exact same tracks, or the same right-of-way is a little bit um, a gray area. But even if it's the same right-of-way, unless you add another 100 feet of horizontal clearance uh, between them, most freight railroads will say no thanks to uh, anything over the 80 miles an hour. This makes high-speed rail, in quotes, look a lot more like an extension of Amtrak and brings out the usual skeptics from their trenches in full force, claiming with some justification that the money spent uh, on high-speed rail would be the equivalent of throwing more money at Amtrak, whether it's by name or by equivalent uh, function. So it's uh, led to a lot of opposition and um, a lot of politicization, as Amtrak uh, is uh, so good at doing. Um, the new Republican governors in, or relatively new, 2010 governors in Florida, Wisconsin, and Ohio, as most of you know, canceled their high-speed rail projects on this basis, that you know, they weren't going to be able to um, do much better than Amtrak, which was a hopeless uh, money loser or other uh, loser in even a bigger sense, and uh, they returned their billions of dollars to Washington. While the Democratic governor in California has made high-speed rail a central component of his policy priority. So again, this is political um, polarization that has occurred in the absence of a clear and effective uh, formula for how to actually do this. I would uh, then turn to saying, well, then what? For high-speed rail capacity in this country to close the gap with the ambitious goals that the President has said, mentioning it in the State of the Union address, that he wants to bring high-speed rail service uh, to within, I think it was 25 miles of 80 percent of the American population, that's a pretty big uh, uh, system. There needs to be design, engineering, manufacturing, and construction capacity that's created or imported quite fast. Um, and I believe that the Buy America provisions that came along with this federal stimulus, which may have had very valid um, generic reasons, have created a, an even greater handicap for high-speed rail as well. Uh, in one interview, I noted that this approach was the equivalent, or would be the equivalent, of Bangladesh saying they're launching a space program and we're going to land astronauts on the moon, but insisting on only using indigenous technology and manufacturing to do it. It can be done, but it's going to take a lot longer and cost a lot more to create 
a Bangladesh moonshot or a U.S. high-speed rail option that's entirely homegrown. Uh, there's just too much reinvention of wheels that has to occur. I'll um, finish by emphasizing two missed opportunities in the way in which the high-speed rail goal was not connected to capacity that deserves special attention. Um, first, the automotive bailout, which I mentioned already. Uh, could have, and in my view should have, come with direction to the uh, companies, particularly General Motors, to get back into the passenger train business. Something that GM was active in through the 1960s, and if you count freight uh, locomotives used to pull Amtrak trains even into the 1970s. If you uh, want to uh, Google train of tomorrow when you get home, you will see that uh, General Motors was active in designing fairly um, innovative passenger trains in the 1940s and 50s. Um, when, when the bets were still being hedged about what might happen with the interstate and uh, auto-oriented development uh, in the U.S. So we've already paid uh, General Motors to come back from the brink and we missed the chance to pay them for something um, that we really need, which is the domestic ability to manufacture these trains, or at least any trains, uh, starting out for passenger service maybe more conventionally and then building up. The second uh, point that uh, no one's noticed, except me, it seems, uh, at least when I looked at it, was that there was over $100 billion in the um, American uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act that was allocated to education and training. But none of that was connected to filling the enormous knowledge gaps that would be needed to really have a national high-speed rail network in the same way that uh, we have the capacity or had to develop the capacity to build a national interstate highway system. Um, no one seems to realize that the U.S. doesn't have the capacity to do this, and yet insisting that no one can from abroad can be involved in it sort of leaves an empty set, which is why politics fills the vacuum. So the gap between policy goals and administrative capacity can be closed, but it will take a very different organizational structure to accomplish this. The two possible ways to do this, and uh, they're not mutually exclusive, are bottom-up. California appears to be the one place where such innovation is happening at the ground level, trying to make their high-speed rail state uh, program work and redesigning the administrative side of it in the hope of getting the physical side going. Um, the other is top-down, and uh, I've elsewhere in some of my research called for a transportation redevelopment agency to uh, take the lead in planning a post-carbon transportation plan for the U.S. Uh, that doesn't mean that it would necessarily implement it, but at least setting out the whole picture of what's needed. High-speed rail would feature prominently in such a plan um, and could be the federal government's uh, uh, focus, uh, a priority in a scenario where the urgency for uh, getting off of oil in our mobility and other parts of our economy is uh, high. So um, perhaps American innovation will build a better organizational context to launch high-speed rail technology somewhere in between these bottom-up and top-down initiatives. I think we have the ability to uh, uh, be creative and innovative in that organizational reconfiguration. And I'm certain that if we can't do that, we're not going to get to the ability to learn about how to really implement high-speed rail from the rest of the world. Thank you.